3,000 years ago in the ancient Near East, wisdom was a warrior woman. In ancient Mesopotamia, including Babylon and Assyria, a female goddess named Ishtar was associated with love, beauty, sex, war, justice, and political power. The relief of Ishtar in the British Museum depicts her holding a rod and a ring that symbolized a measuring string and a yardstick. She held surprisingly domestic tools for a goddess of war, justice, and power. Ishtar was poised for action, for war, and for work. Ishtar was a later iteration of the Sumerian goddess Inanna, who was associated with the storehouse, with weather and fertility, known as the queen of the universe. It's interesting that in neighboring Israel, around the same time in history, Lady Wisdom was also depicted engaging in the public sphere. She cried out in the streets and condemned fools to disaster. Created by God at the beginning of his work in the creation of the world, Wisdom rejoiced and delighted in humanity. As the book of Proverbs closes, theologian Al Walters calls the song of the valiant woman in Proverbs 31, 10 through 31, a heroic hymn. This acrostic poem praises Lady Wisdom as a woman who fears God, who is to be praised by her children and family. She's profitable in business, a leader who has compassion for the poor and is fearless towards the future. She is heroic in her impact, heroic in her unmatched valor. And like the Mesopotamian goddess, she too holds tools in her left and her right hand. But unlike Ishtar, she holds out hope kindness and love when she extends her hands a second time to the poor and the needy. So what happened to this fearless leader in the marketplace? How was she replaced by the Greek image of Sophia, wisdom, an aristocratic goddess of wisdom, the goddess of you know, the library? We find these modern conceptualization of wisdom, of the lady wisdom, depicting a domesticated version of wisdom and beauty to be worshiped in an ethereal light. So I'm a business professor who began my career as an enlisted soldier in the US Army. I had multiple specialties in the Army, but I spent the majority of my time as an enlisted soldier in the field working in explosive warehouses in the Ordnance Corps. In my first civilian job in business, I worked in operations for a small packaging importer, which means I coordinated the purchasing from international suppliers and manufacturers, I coordinated international transportation, domestic warehousing, and that final delivery to the customer. The irony of the Sumerian goddess of the storehouse, my own humble beginnings in warehousing, and the Proverbs 31 model of wisdom is not lost on me. I think that maybe my background in the military, my start in logistics, transportation, and warehousing, and my subsequent decades of study in the field of supply chain management give me a unique lens through which I read the story of Lady Wisdom in Proverbs 1 through 9, and then again as this valiant woman in Proverbs 31, 10 through 31. It's fundamental to note that wisdom was personified as a woman all throughout the ancient Near East. Lady Wisdom shows up in Proverbs 1 through 9 as a voice of wisdom in the public square. And in the final text in the book of Proverbs, Lady Wisdom shows up again As a noble woman, a lot of times our Bibles read the excellent wife. But this is an A to Z acrostic poem in Proverbs 31, 10 through 31, 21 verses that echo Proverbs 1 through 9 as wisdom shows up again as a woman of action. The noble woman in Proverbs 31, 10 through 31 reflects Lady Wisdom in the first part of the book of Proverbs. And here she is again, not calling out in the streets like Lady Wisdom shows up at the beginning, but now she's personified in action in the marketplace. And throughout those 21 verses that follow the Hebrew alphabet, um, there are so many verses in comparison between the beginning of Proverbs that introduces Lady Wisdom, the Psalms, wisdom literature written by King David, and how Solomon closes Proverbs 31, 10 through 31, at the end of his, his, his epistle on wisdom. So listen to these verses in comparison. In Proverbs 1, 3, 8, and Psalms 111, we see the fear of God as central to the concept of wisdom. In Proverbs 1, 7, it says, the fear of God is the beginning of knowledge, and fools despise wisdom and instruction. David wrote in Psalm 111 that the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. 
Proverbs 31, 30 closes saying that charm is deceitful and beauty is vain, but a woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. Proverbs 3 and 8 also tell us that wisdom is hard to find, but when you do, she's worth more than great treasure. Proverbs 3 says, blessed are those who find wisdom, those who gain understanding, for she's far more profitable than silver and yields better returns than gold. She's more precious than rubies. Nothing compares to her. We see this again in Proverbs 31, verse 10 and 29, when we hear the words, a capable woman who can find, she's far more precious than jewels. We see in verse 29 that Proverbs 31 says, Many women do noble things, but you surpass them all. Wisdom is hard to find and surpasses our wildest dreams. We also see that wisdom cares for her household. She cares for her servants, for her employees. Proverbs 9, wisdom builds her house. She hews the seven pillars. She slaughters animals and mixes wine, and she sets a table. Then she sends her servants out into the streets, calling from the highest places in town. God himself, in David's writing, he prepares food for those who fear him, and he remembers his promises, his covenant to them forever. In Proverbs 31, wisdom shows up again as Lady Wisdom in the same light. She's like the ships of the merchants. Her food comes and she sources it from far away. She rises while it's night and provides food for her household and tasks for her servant girls. Then we see that wisdom promises long life. And that wisdom is always holding promises in her right and her left hand. In Proverbs 3, 16 through 17, wisdom has long life in her right hand. In her left hand are riches and honor. Her ways are pleasant and all her paths are peace. We see again in Proverbs 31 that her merchandise is profitable. Her lamp doesn't go out at night. And in her hands, she grasps the distaff and the spindle. We see wisdom is giving to the poor with the excess of what she has from the work that she does. And finally, wisdom is not shaken by bad news. Wisdom doesn't fear the future. Psalms 112, David says, surely the righteous will never be shaken. They will be remembered forever. They will have no fear of bad news because their hearts are steadfast, trusting in the Lord. Proverbs 31, 21, she's not afraid for her household when it snows. For all her household, all of her servants, her children, her husband, everyone in the whole home is clothed in crimson. And she laughs at the future. She laughs at the time to come. So what is this picture of wisdom personified in the marketplace, creating textile products, um, delivering profit, and investing with that money in growing her business, but also caring for the poor? We think about wisdom written about 3,000 years ago by King Solomon. And when Solomon prayed to God, and he was taking over the throne of Israel, he was becoming king in the footsteps of his father David, one of the most loved kings in their history, although there was only one before David, but one of the most loved kings in Israel's history. And God asked Solomon, what does he want? And Solomon prays to God for wisdom. And God gifts him with this divine, supernatural wisdom. But he's so blessed that Solomon asks him for wisdom and not riches or honor or, you know, a long legacy on his throne that he actually blesses Solomon with all of those things that he didn't even ask him for. So when we look at wisdom throughout the writing of Solomon, this court literature that is the wisdom literature from 3,000 years ago, similar to the literature that came out of Assyria to the north and Egypt and Babylon, this literature commissioned by Solomon, by the scribes of his court, actually described civic life. What does it look like to serve God, to be righteous, and to, to conduct transactions in the marketplace well? Read Proverbs 20 if you don't believe me. It's all about doing business and living life really well. So we're 3,000 years away from that. What does wisdom look like today? Wisdom most simply defined is the ability to discern right from wrong. And wisdom literature in the ancient Near East similarly informed people on how to discern the path of righteousness. So Lady Wisdom, she instructed others in the ways of righteousness, in the way of peace and blessing Listen to the words of this passage, this 21-verse acrostic, through the lens of instruction in living. 
And think about how these principles, how the life of this noble woman can be applied in business, in our lives, in the good work we do today. Proverbs 31, 10 through 31 reads like this, starting with A, a capable wife, a capable woman who can find. She is far more precious than jewels. The heart of her husband trusts in her and he will have no lack of gain. She does him good and not harm all the days of her life. She seeks wool and flax and works with willing hands. She's like the ships of the merchant and she brings her food from far away. She rises while it is still night and provides food for her household. She provides tasks for her servant girls. She considers a field and buys it with the fruit of her hands, with her profit, she plants a vineyard. She girds herself with strength and makes her arms strong. She perceives that her merchandise is profitable and her lamp does not go out at night. She puts her hands to the distaff and her hands hold the spindle, but she opens her hands to the poor and reaches out her hands to the needy. She's not afraid for her household when it snows, for all her household are clothed in crimson. She bakes herself coverings. Her clothing is fine linen and purple. Her husband, he's known in the city gates and taking his seat among the elders of the land. She makes linen, garments, and sells them. She supplies the merchants with sashes. Strength and dignity are her clothing, and she laughs at the time to come. She opens her mouth with wisdom, and the teaching of kindness is on her tongue. She looks well to the ways of her household and does not eat the bread of idleness. Her children rise up and call her happy, and her husband, too, he praises her. Many women have done excellently, but you surpass them all. Charm is deceitful and beauty is vain, but a woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. Give her a share in her profits, in the fruit of her hands, and let her works praise her in the city gates. We hear in this passage from 3,000 years ago, this lady wisdom who shows up at the end of the book of Proverbs, and the Eset Chayel or Chayel Eset actually means the valiant woman. And we see here that wisdom is personified not on a throne like King David or King Solomon, the wisest of the kings of Israel. And it, wisdom is not personified as a priest in the temple. Instead, wisdom is, is personified as this woman who is a wife and a, a mom, and she seems to be running a business in the textile industry in the ancient Israel trades. She's buying and sourcing raw materials in the marketplace. She's transforming them into sashes that merchants are coming from afar to buy. She's got servants and employees. She is caring for the poor with the fruit of her labors, and she's expanding and building out her business portfolio with the profits that she has made. And when we think about the Jewish and Christian traditions, followers of God from the very beginning have been called to be a blessing to the nations. Followers of God have been called to make disciples of the nations. We see this in Genesis 12, 2 through 3, as well as in Matthew 28, 19. And I think it's important that when we read that we are called as followers of God, that we are called in Jesus' great commission to go into all the world and make disciples of nations, the work of the cross is not merely saving us from our sins, from our own inability to be righteous, but he instead, through the work on the cross, Jesus saves us from our sin for life in this world. We are called to extend the kingdom and bring righteousness, peace, justice, mercy, and blessing as we disciple the nations. So what does this look like in business? And I was so amazed by this passage right before I began my PhD in logistics and marketing. I was reading through this in a women's Bible study, of course, where you read Proverbs 31. And it struck me as we were reading this passage, as you maybe heard in the passage as we just read through it, how much this woman was in action. How much of her work wasn't just domestic, but was also in the market, trading and selling and buying and bringing profit into her home. And as we think about this, as I thought about this passage, as I went through my PhD program and began to work with Fortune 500 companies, I heard over and over in the best practices of the leading 50 to 100 companies globally, 
that the things that set them apart in terms of competitive advantage and profitability boil down to things like loving people well, loving their employees well, being profitable for their shareholders, of course, and being responsible with their profitability, but also understanding their customers well and understanding their suppliers well. And it's a challenge because business is all about trade-offs. And so how do you discern what is good? How do you discern what is right? And I was amazed by you know, what I knew to be secular business you know, leaders stating that the way that they saw themselves performing and doing the best in business was there's actually principles that are fairly biblical and stand out in Proverbs, in Scripture. So when you think about this and all of the decisions that get made in business, it's difficult to know what is right. What is wrong? What is righteous? And it's not just our Sunday worship, but if we, we stay disciples of Christ, commissioned into the kingdom of heaven on Monday, it's got to change not just our faith, but the good work that God's called us to do, if we follow Lady Wisdom, in the marketplace as well. I love in the epistles written by James, the one epistle written by James, it's called the, the wisdom book of the epistles. James says that we are not only called to be a people of faith, but we're called to be a people of good work. And that faith alone isn't enough, but we can show people our faith by the good work that we do. And that word for work, ergon, is, it isn't some, you know, you know, just feeding the poor. It's all the good work we do. It's the profitability. It's the products we bring into the marketplace. It's our skills. It's the things that God has gifted us to do that create opportunity and blessing for others. So James says, he encourages us, it's, it's difficult to be wise. It's difficult to know what is the right decision. And he says, who is wise and understanding among you? In James 3, he writes, let them show it by their good life, by deeds, by their good work done in humility that comes from wisdom. And we know that Proverbs tells us that wisdom starts from a fear and awe of God, which inspires us to love him. And I love this concept of the fear of God. Because the word yare in Hebrew, it doesn't mean that we're afraid of God, like in fear and trembling, although it can. It's actually a deeper word. It has more meaning than that. The word yare actually means awe. And think about, you know, the first time you saw the mountains or you saw the ocean roll in on the beach and its expanse and how big it is. It takes your breath away. I mean, I grew up in the Midwest. That was like Michigan for me. But it's massive and you can't see the other side. And this is the kind of awe that we feel when we see the creation that our awesome creator made. How much more when we dwell on the amazingness of God do we fall in love with him? We want a vacation in God like we want to go to the beach and the mountains. We're in awe of him. And when we're in awe of God, when we fear him because he's amazing, I think we fall deeper in love with him. And wisdom then calls us not just to be in awe of God and to fear him. That's the starting place. Wisdom then calls us to love others, to be the people that cry out in the streets, don't be foolish. Come into my household where there is food and jobs and opportunity and blessing and kindness. This can translate easily into our work, into business strategy. And even though it feels like a foreign concept, in many ways, it is. It's an ancient concept. When we think about wisdom in business in this way, if we think about what's happening in this passage in Proverbs 31, 10 through 31, which is actually a standalone 21 verses in the Hebrew Bible. It's its own chapter. This A to Z acrostic of wisdom and action. We see that wisdom starts with serving others. That Lady Wisdom is there. She's not conducting a business for her own fame and for her own glory, even though she is known and praised and blessed in the city. No, she's serving her husband and her children and her servants themselves. They're cared for. Even though it's by the work of her hands, she's the one that's not being idle. Wisdom is a servant first, just like Jesus came not to be served, but to serve. This is how we can personify the gospel in creating disciples of nations by being servants. And just like I heard from those Fortune 500 companies when I was doing work at the beginning of my, my research in business as a business scholar and professor today, you hear things that work in business that are also really um, timeless strategies, timeless ways of, of philosophizing about business. And thinking about, what it, why are you at work? Why do we work? Well, it's to honor God. We are created for work. 
We see in best practices in business today a long-term orientation like Lady Wisdom in Proverbs 31. This view to the future, to the next generation that your children will call you blessed, that your children's generation will benefit from the work of your business, that the resources that you leave behind are enough for them and they will walk into the blessing of the work that you've done. We also see in best practices in business today a stakeholder strategy. It's not just about being profitable for shareholders, because you, be, you can gain the whole world and lose your soul. Jesus is really clear about that. No, when you have a love for others, like we're called to by Jesus in the new commission, that we love others like he loved us, we now love our shareholders who've invested in our business. We also love our employees, our servants, getting up at night and preparing tasks so that their work is meaningful. We love our customers, that the products we create are quality products, that they are worth coming from a, a distance. The merchants came to buy her sashes. We see that our suppliers are blessed in our transactions. Proverbs 20 talks a lot about negotiating with suppliers and buying products in the marketplace. We see a sustainability strategy come through in best practices in business today. So we're talking environmental, social, and economic sustainability. This business ha is set to have a long-term impact for decades, generations to come. This kind of sustainability orientation we see in Proverbs 31, not only is she profitable, it says that almost a dozen times, she's engaging in the natural environment and she's caring for her community through the excess, through the profit of her business. We also see an ancient supply chain. Israel was a trade space sitting between you know, Assyria to the north and Egypt to the south and Babylon. Let's get some geography in here. And their people came from all over the world to trade. They were on a harbor, on a sea, and this woman was trading and buying and creating business that was profitable, that the world was converging on Israel. This is an impact on the nations around her. And she was having it through the marketplace. Finally, we see that the products she made were quality. They were fit for royalty. Linen is one of the most difficult textiles to source and to create. And, and crimson is the color of royalty that she herself was wearing and her household was clothed in scarlet. There was nothing cheap about the work of Lady Wisdom in the marketplace. And out of this, she's profitable. She has an amazing reputation. Not only is she reputable, but her husband as well. God gains reputation when we do our work well in the marketplace. She was comparatively advantaged. She surpassed all others. And her impact left a legacy for the next generation to praise. Can we all want our businesses to look like this? We can all lean into wisdom. It says in Proverbs 1, 1 through 7, as we read wisdom literature and scripture, it's for learning about wisdom and instruction, for understanding words of insight, for gaining instruction in wise dealing, righteousness, justice, and equity. Wisdom literature is to teach shrewdness to the simple and knowledge and prudence to the young. Let the wise also hear and gain more learning and the discerning acquire skills, skills to understand a proverb and, and figures and these parables, the words of their wise and their riddles. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. Proverbs 1, 1 through 7 sets us out to understand wisdom literature and the whole book of wisdom so that wisdom can be positioned as our motivation to become skillful for the good work that God has called us to do. We, like I said, are called not from this world, but to have impact on this world for the kingdom of heaven. And wisdom literature and scripture not only paves a way for us to do this, but it actually confirms what we see in the world around us. God's creation um, longs to see his glory displayed. We see best practice in business actually providing evidence that scripture, that wisdom from 3,000 years ago still works today. It still positions us to think in a way, to strategize in a way that we are not only profitable, that we are a blessing and we have an impact for the kingdom of heaven in the work that we are doing.